The presenter this evening is uh, Professor Muhammad Imam. He is a professor and consultant trauma and orthopedic upper limb surgeon at Trowley Bristol Orthopedic Center and the University of East London. He is a very keen um, researcher. He's published extensively and he's also a very keen um, educator. He's been with us and uh, his lectures and teachings are always very well received. So we're very pleased that he accepted our invitation uh, to be with us uh, tonight. Uh, and I'm sure we all will learn from a lot from him. So my name is Firas Arnaut. I'll be moderating this session. Um, and with us, uh, we have Hannah and Imogen the, from the education team of ORUK. So the session tonight will include a short, uh, very focused lecture on uh, distal humerus fractures. Uh, the focus of this lecture uh, this evening is on the FRCS exam. So that's the level we will be aiming at. Um, the lecture will be followed by MCQ questions. Um, this will be from the lecture. So please uh, stay concentrated and uh, you can answer the questions correctly. Following that, uh, obviously there will be an, an opportunity for, for you to ask you questions. So if you have any doubts or any questions you have in mind, anything not clear, please put your questions in the chat box um, and we will present these questions to Prof. Imam at the end. At the, and at the end of the session, there will be opportunity for those who are interested to take part in the hot seat viva practice. Uh, this section will not be recorded and uh, we encourage everyone who's, um, who feels that they want to uh, participate to um, let us know through the chat box or raise their hands or let uh, myself or Hannah or Imogen on, um, let know that you are interested in taking part in the Viva. So we have only three spaces, maximum three spaces available for that. We understand how the Viva and talking in front of people in this situation can be very stressful. We all been there and we will be as supportive to you as we can. So the aim is for this session overall to be an interactive session. So please ask your questions and give us your feedback. And if you miss any part of the presentation, don't worry. It will be, it is, it's been recorded and it will be on the Orthopedic Academy and on the ORUK website uh, uh, very uh, shortly. And uh, And just a reminder before I hand over to Prof. Imam, that's the reminder of our courses. So we have our um, mock exam course, um, the first of its kind um, in the UK. And we started that last year, in September last year. Um, and uh, we are doing two more courses um, coming up, one on the 4th of December and one was 22nd of January. Uh, to book these courses. Uh, these are obviously, these courses, you, we they simulate the real exam going through all Viva tables and clinical stations as if you are in the real exam, all be timed and, and you'll be given some feedback as well and results at the end. Uh, so you could book these courses on our UK website. Um, we have other courses, we have case-based discussion courses. Um, um, on the 11th of December and 15th of January coming up. And these courses are for a very small group of people when you go through around 50 exam specific questions and we give you the answers and we will give you feedback and we give you detailed ans um, answers of this, you know, ideal answer, basically detailed explanation of the ideal answer. So it's very useful for those who, who, who um, want to test their ability to answer questions, but they also want to improve their knowledge, okay? Um, and that we do the same style for our basic sciences course on 29th of January, but we'll be only focused all day on basic sciences. So it's very good uh, last minute revision. So these courses are on the orthopedicacademy.co.uk website. So without further ado, I will um, leave you now with, um, uh, Prof. Imam to start his teaching session. Over to you, Muhammad. Thank you very much for us and thank you to the Orthopedic Academy and ORUK for the kind invitation and thanks as well for the great work you're doing over the last uh, 
or over long time actually, uh, which is a great aid for those undertaking the FRCS uh, exam. And thanks for the great, uh, introduction. Uh, so actually I'm going to, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about distal humerus fractures. We know that distal humerus fractures are very common. They represent actually up to 6% of all other fractures and 10% of all elbow fractures. And according to Robinson in 2003, that uh, have uh, published that the number is actually increasing in frequency because the number of elderly individuals continue to grow. Plus it is actually uh, now elderly individuals have more active lifestyles compared with uh, before. So the, it is important for FRCS purposes to understand that in trauma stations, it is, it is crucial to talk about management and in-depth knowledge is expected in trauma vivas, especially compared with the other viva stations. Also, to some extent in basic sciences, you need to know a bit more, but you can actually discuss uh, a bit more superficial in the, in the majority of uh, other viva stations. And actually for any fracture, it's good to understand the goals of any initial evaluation. When you're managing an, any fracture in real life and in exam uh, scenarios, you have to understand the pattern, the geometry, and actually understand the previous symptomatic pathology as well. Because if you have someone with arthritis of the shoulder and having proximal humeral fracture, possibly the best treatment option would be a shoulder replacement. Also the same, someone elderly with a lot of, uh, with distal humeral fracture and uh, arthritis and possibly a total elbow replacement would be the best option. It's crucial to identify uh, neurovascular injuries and soft tissue problems like open fractures and so, and for exam purposes, you can assume things. So if you see someone with a capitellum fracture, you can assume it's an isolated injury with intact neurovascular compromise, because what you really need to appreciate in the exam is that this four and a half minutes it's not five because usually half a minute is wasted from the previous question or the next question. So these four and a half minutes are crucial. They are very precious minutes for you to utilize properly in order to identify the problem and address uh, uh, address the what the exam uh, what the examiner want you to talk about. So in order to understand the distal humerus, we have, it is actually a complex structure where the distal end of the humerus is flattened, expanded transversely and rounded at the end. You have to understand also the distribution of the articular cartilage where the posterior aspect of the capitellum has no articular cartilage. There is a downward projection uh, of the trochlea which is responsible about the carrying angle, which is increased in women. And that's important when you are reconstructing these injuries in real life. You uh, we can see here, uh, you are also, if you look at the distal humerus in cross section at the level of the fossa of the olecranon, the two columns on either side of the fossa are dense and strong and offers a good hold for screws, but with the elbow in extension, the tip of the olecranon actually lodges in the olecranon fossa. So that's why when I'm doing these, I have to extend the elbow properly in order to make sure that it's not the, the fossa is not blocked by a screw or a plate. And finally, the, at the, uh, when you look at the humerus inflection, you have to appreciate the movement and test it whenever you are addressing these injuries, because it's a complex structure of the distal humerus. And in the exam, you should highlight these aspects because it demonstrates lateral thinking and that actually would enable, will differentiate you among the crowd doing the exam. So here, if you look at the AP of the distal humerus, there is 94 to 98 degree angle between the axis of the humerus, it's a red line, and the trochlea, which is the orange line, which if you can see it. 
And then if you look at the medial view of the distal humerus, the medial column, which is orange here, makes around 10 degrees angulation to the longitudinal humerus and positioning the trochlea slightly in front of the humeral shaft, which is crucial when you are reconstructing these fractures. And if you look at the lateral view, the lateral column makes around 30 degrees angulation to the humeral axis. Therefore, the capitellum is positioned in front of the humeral diaphysis. So both capitellum and trochlea are positioned anteriorly, which is important to understand if there is commun significant comminutions. A comminution. Fractures of the distal humerus actually fall into two categories, the simple metaphysial type A, according to the AO, and the partial articular type B, condylar fractures. And the formal two types, although sometimes are part of a more complex injury, such as a dislocation of the elbow, it is easy to treat, and they are usually associated with good prognosis. Different classifications for the humerus is not really, sorry, distal humeral fractures is not really needed for the exam, but for extra articular type fractures, uh, you just need to know that this is type A and the partial articular type fractures, these are type B and type C are the complete articular fractures according to the Muller classification or the AO classification. So it is actually, we feel, at the, from a prognostic point of view, it is more prudent to group fractures around the elbow into those with good prognosis and those with poor prognosis. And to discuss each type separately, since each has its distinguishing features worthy of mention. Also the supracondylar fractures and those with extension into the joint can be grouped together. And this is really important in the exam. So if you are seeing a fracture with single intraarticular extension, you can say it's an intraarticular fracture. You understand the gravity. I warn patient about uh, the, the long and short term sequelae of that fracture, but it might be of good association. If you have a, an impacted uh, fracture, this is also good to understand. And we can classify them according to Schatzker to fractures with good prognosis and fractures with bad prognosis. Like an avulsion injury would be good prognosis, fractures, uh, intraarticular fractures might be, some of them might be always good prognosis, while others might be of bad prognosis. And identifying these things initially in the exam demonstrates that you, can, you are a safe surgeon, you have mutual discussions with your patients before surgery, you understand your remit, and you understand what you're offering to the patient. So uh, you can def definitely differentiate between good and bad prognostic factors when you are managing these types of injuries. And the majority of intraarticular fractures, you can actually highlight the gravity of the situation. And that demonstrates you're a safe surgeon. Remember, in the exam, you are a day one consultant. You're not a registrar or a fellow who actually says, oh, this is plain radiograph showing so and so. You're someone who takes the initiative and demonstrate leadership. And at any time point in the exam, you should demonstrate lateral thinking. Everything you mention in the exam, uh, any question you ask is actually based on something you want to discuss treatment wise later on. So if you see a bad injury, say it loud, it's bad injury. And if you say something that's wrong, retract it, say, sorry, I'd like to retract what I've just said, actually, so and so. Never, there is no wrong, uh, there is no right answer, but there are wrong answers. So let's go through different the fractures you can see. Capitellum fracture, a coronal shear fracture. You can see here the double purple sign, which involves the capitellum and the trochlea or a combination of both. It is uncommon, around maybe 6% of all distal humeral fractures and 1% of all elbow fractures, but they can be easily missed. We've noticed recently a progressive increase in their incidence, maybe because we're picking them up now, maybe because we do more CT scans. However, the majority of these will be a fall on outstretched hand with the elbow partially flexed and the forearm pronated. That's how you snap the capitulum and have a coronal fracture. 
so it can also happen if someone has a posterolateral rotatory dislocation and you uh, and then it is reducing back because the radial head will have an impact against the capitellum as well as the trochlea, the radial head and the coronoid against the capitellum and the trochlea as well. So having a fracture only of the capitellum, we discuss, we actually initially, we thought it is only a fracture of the only capitellum and then we classified according to Brian and Mori into these three types and each of them has a mnemonic. But then McKee made the modification saying that actually if the fracture, which is actually more common than what we used to think, a coronal shear fracture that includes both the capitellum and trochlea. And of course, for type three, it will be a more nasty injury that you need to address as well and identify. You don't really need to remember different mnemonic, different names for different fractures or different classifications. But if it is better to understand each and highlight that you understand the problem because that will dictate your management. Because Ringetel defined the articular fractures of the distal humerus, noting that these lesions not, uh, often not only are coronal share and the of the capitellum and the trochlea, but they involve as well the lateral epicondyle or the lateral column and can involve the posterior part of the trochlea and the medial epicondyle as well because of the progression of trauma. Doubly, in 2006, proposed the name capitellum and trochlea fractures because these are very common. And then they identified a prognostic fact as a prognostic factor that differentiates the treatment. The, you usually access them, what I would do in the exam if you have this, you access them through the lateral approach. You can use either the Kaplan or the Cooker approach based on the dissection done to you by the fracture itself during the traumatic incident itself. And then I use the lateral uh, collateral ligament sparing approach. You stick to the bone, lift it all up, and then fix these fractures with uh, screws, uh, headless screws, or Sometimes, and of course, CT scan is mandatory to all these injuries to identify the problem. And then which approach to use, that's actually something you can mention in the exam. I'll, I'll, the majority of this I can fix through a Cooker LCL preserving approach. But if there is extensive expansion of the fracture to the trochlea, you can discuss the uh, olecron on uh, the cooker extensile approach if it is worse and you can see in type C fractures here at the top image, you can use an olecron osteotomy to manage these. And this is you can identify with CT scan. And if you demonstrate that in the exam, you understand these things, you're scoring higher and higher. And as I said, you can fix it with screws uh, like here or biodegradable screws, which is something I started to use myself, which you can mention in the exam, but stick to the standard, which would be the headless screws, which you use. This is the type, actually, when you have an extensile capitellum trochlea, including the column as well, and then you can either use the screws, the headless screws to fix it, and the, which is can be enough here, as you can see in this patient, and this is a patient where we fixed with he four headless screws, uh, sorry, four biodegradable screws and reconstructed the ligament as well. There are advantages and disadvantages, but you know, I wouldn't go that far in the exam, just stick to whatever you want. This is becoming more and more common nowadays to fix these injuries. You can go through the approach, discuss different options. And of course, if you are worried, I'll always have a low threshold of fixing it with a plate as well. So what about the fractures with poor prognosis or type C fractures? In order to prevent stiffness, we have to identify fractures with poor prognosis because in all, uh, all periarticular and intraarticular fractures require early active motion. That's crucial. Prolonged plaster immobilization leads to irreversible joint stiffness. And that's not 
cannot be fixed. We can we go and do arthroscopic release, we do open lateral cordon release or over the top medial release, but still the best option for this patient is to reconstruct the fracture and correct the metaphyseal and diaphyseal deformity so that you reduce the stress on the articular cartilage. Same to what we use in knees for tibial plateaus, what Chasker have published many years ago in the similar papers. And actually before Chasker, Sir John Charlie in 1961 said that the perfect anatomic restoration and perfect freedom of joint movement can be obtained by internal fixations. And so we actually, even if in that age where they couldn't fix all these fractures and they did have less toys compared with what we have today, they used to manage these by, by traction and early motion. So we know for sure that for intraarticular fractures, early motion is crucial. And actually, for exam purposes, whenever you have an intraarticular fraction, you should highlight that immobilization can cause joint stiffness. If you fix it, and immobilize it, that actually is associated with worse stiffness. And if you have a depressed articular fragment, you and you cannot reduce by closed manipulation, then you wouldn't be able to reduce by closed means. So you have to open it and reduce it. And actually, if you have a major depression, it wouldn't fill with fibrocartilage and the instability and displacement that can happen will be permanent. So that's why, in these injuries, you say my principles is to achieve an anatomic reduction, solid internal fixations that would enable me to achieve early, mod, uh, early mobilization and full range of motion. And that applies to any art intraarticular fracture you see in the exam. You have to restore the joint congruity. And the, if you have metaphyseal defect, whether it's a proximal humerus, whether it's a typical plateau or a distal humerus, you can mention that you can achieve it by bone grafting and whatever form of bone grafting. And you have to, we have to achieve, uh, address all displacements, either in the diaphysis or the metaphysis, in order to prevent the joint overload based on the Schatzker theory. And correction is crucial for joint stability and for long-term function. Immediate motion is a must and that requires solid internal fixation. And that's actually why we're reading all about the biomechanics of bone fixation, different types of healing. And that will, then you will be able to help all your patients based uh, on long and short term methods. And that's actually would enable you to address any of these injuries at all time points. So for distal humerus then, what's specific about it? In any also intraarticular uh, fraction, you can easily say there are factors that are dictating my decision. And these factors include the patient demographics, the fracture demographics, the degree of displacement and the degree of comminution and joint involvement. These are the four factors that influence all our decisions in any trauma setting. And actually you can use that slide in any case you have when there is a complex intra-articular fracture in the exam. So applying that here, we have to understand again, I repeat, there are no right decisions in the exam, but there is definitely wrong decisions, wrong fixation methods, and that's actually important for the exam. Another important aspect that you need to be discussing in the exam is whether you're going to use parallel or perpendicular uh, construct when you are managing these distal humerus intraarticular fractures. Because there are two different philosophies. The orthogonal technique, otherwise known as the 99 plating or per perpendicular plating, and that's what the AO supports, which, which simply consists of placing two plates at 90 degrees angle to one another with the lateral plate placed on the coronal plane along the posterior aspect of the lateral column and the medial plate applied to the posterior medial ridge. 
While the parallel plating was popularized by Sean O'Driscoll from Mayo Clinic uh, in 2005, and then Sanchez Solito published, uh, who's also in Mayo Clinic in 2007, and they said that, you know, this is actually more biomechanical superior as each plate is actually rotated slightly one towards the other in the sagittal plane, and the angle between them is 150 or 160 degrees, and the orientation would permit to limit soft tissue detachment of the posterior lateral uh, side and insert bicortical screws from both sides. Actually, and the evidence has been contradictory, and there is different evidence supporting each of these two, but you can just stick to one way or another and support whatever you feel appropriate. For me, I would opt for one of these two based on the fracture configuration. Some fractures, it's better to fix them using the AO principles. The other ones would be based, uh, it would be better to fix them through the uh, parallel uh, technique. And that's based on fracture geometry and morphology as discussed earlier. Whenever you are aiming to fix these, you have to achieve eight commands. The first thing is you have to maximize it. This is actually more a clinical uh, tips than exam wise, but if I'm here, I'm going to tell you this. Each screw should pass through the plate, which is crucial. If you can, of course, you can do screws outside the plate if you have to, but I would aim for that as much as I can. I would aim to maximize the fixation in the distal fragment as much as I can and apply true compression at the supracondylar level. Each screw you're using should engage a fragment on the opposite side that's also fixed by the plate, which would be ideal. We're talking about ideal scenarios here. An adequate number of screws should be placed in the distal fragment, as I said, and screws should be as long as possible. Avoid screws occluding the molecular uh, fossa, and they should lock together by interdigitation, creating a fixed angle structure and linking the columns together. This is also crucial. You have also the plates should be applied so that compression is achieved at the supracondylar level for both columns. And plates should be strong enough and biomechanically stiff enough to avoid breaking and bending. And that's if you follow this, the chances of you having problems is actually low. And this was also mentioned before. Sanchez Solito mentions a shortening osteotomy, which you can achieve uh, without a problem. Uh, uh, this is a paper published in 2007, which, you know, it's beyond, uh, this is another option. Also, one important thing you have to understand that if you have an elderly fracture, with this problem, McKee et al. in 2009 highlighted the a total elbow implant with substitution or a hemiarthroplasty can be an excellent option and is associated with significant improvement. And we started seeing a lot, not a lot, but more uh, presentations like this where a, show, a total elbow replacement is actually the best option. So that's something to keep in mind if you have uh, a patient with this problem, a total, an acute total elbow replacement is not a bad option for some elderly low demand patients. And obviously, if you're mentioning that, you can mention the GERF saying that this should be done in specific centers and GERF has highlighted these centers in each, uh, have uh, identified these centers in each region. There are different constructs, different techniques in fixing this, but all what you need for the exam is to, high, uh, to identify the biomechanical demands, identify the biomechanical aspects of each of these. In certain fractures, you have to identify if there's a supracondylar fracture plus an intraarticular fracture, and then you can address both problems. Because if you have like a capitellum fracture with supracondylar fracture, and the fracture is large enough to allow for stable fixation, then you have to fix it. And the exposure you hear would be lateral with the fixation from posterior aspect or other ways, but this is based on the presentation. Uh, I, there is newer, uh, you know, now there is some uh, 
trend into doing arthroscopic assisted technique, I don't think you need to mention that in the exam unless uh, it is a case that actually clearly uh, demands that option. Coronoid, coronoid fractures can be also addressed if you have, if you're doing arthroscopy and fix it and you have to identify distal uh, fractures in association with complex intraarticular distal humeral fractures. Position when you are going through your technique, you have to tell your approach as if you're telling a story. And every time I give a talk, I mention that because you know one of the most boring bits is actually telling an approach the way it's interneural plane, intermuscular plane, all that stuff. I'll position the patient so and so. I'll have the head away from the anesthetic machine. I'll have the arm coming from the top. I'll make sure there is a good access to the elbow before prepping and draping because that's also demonstrate lateral thinking and give the examiner the confidence that you are a surgeon who has done that before and you are a safe surgeon who knows what they are talking about. You will mention whether you're going to do an olecron osteotomy for complex intraarticular fractures. You have to mention how you're going to do it and, whether, and what you are going to do in advance, which will enable them to make sure you have a clear preoperative plan and you outline what you're going to do. Chatsker, proposed and uh, uh, the sequence of fixing these many years ago, you can say whatever you want in these uh, regards. Uh, you can also, uh, you can make sure you have a plan whenever you are fixing these and converting a comp multiple fragments into smaller number of fragments into two fragments and fix the joint first and then fix the distal fragment to the proximal fragment. These are all technical bits you can mesh, uh, sorry, you can mention while doing the exam. Uh, while in the exam, always mention you are going to identify the ulnar nerve first. And based on different classification, different fracture presentations, you can actually identify your approach. And this is a very nice uh, diagram that would enable you to have a good uh, pre-operative planning when you have one of these injuries and you're fixing it. An electron osteotomy is something many would do, although you have to warn the patients and the examiners that you are aware that they might not heal and can be symptomatic. Another good approach, which I prefer, is the trap approach in which I reflect the triceps and conius medical, and that actually enables me to have very good approach to the distal humerus, and, there is, and that would enable us to avoid the osteotomy problems. Physiotherapy is crucial. Physiotherapy is mandatory for this, and early mobilization is it's not an option. It is actually you have to aim for early mobilization at all times in these engines. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Prof. Uh, Imam, for this comprehensive and focused lecture on distal humerus fractures. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting how much um, is really, how wide and big this topic is. Um, and you could see how the exam question could go into so many different directions, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, um, so thank you very much for covering this uh, for us. Um, in terms of it, point to remember for me, uh, uh, which are related to the exam, I've, I'd like to comment about when you start with seeing these fractures, or indeed any other fracture in, in a trauma situation, it's good to mention what you said about it's, it, this fracture has a good prognosis or poor prognosis. And I think intra-articular comminuted fractures, you could just tell the examiner straight away, these fractures carry poor prognosis. And I think that will show the higher order thinking that will show the examiner that when you talk to the patient from the outset, you're gonna explain to them the, the poor prognosis of their injuries and they will be well informed. You're managing the patient's expectations uh, from the outset. And that's very, very important on exam. More important than a lot of other, uh, uh, you know, more important, I would say for me, if I'm examiner to know that the candidate is able to tell that to a patient, it's more important than 
classifications. For um, and also another point I picked up from you is about which also shows the higher order thinking is is how you explain when you explain your approach, and if you're saying that surgical plane, you will follow the surgical plane that's been dissected by the fracture. And you know, you're know you not just gonna use the approach you know, or Cocker approach or exactly what you know. If, if you open up and you find the fracture have dissected another plane for you, then you have that flexibility of moving your approach um, to that one. And that also shows the examiner, you've done these operations, you've been there, and you're not just re you know, regurgitating um, knowledge you've actually, from the book, you've actually been there. And I think these very, very, very important points to give you higher marks in the exam. So I keep learning from you, uh, Prof, every time you're no, 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 a no, lecturer. No, I'm listening to you. I, yeah. know, I, I actually, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you have all that from before. But actually, I think also, of course, uh, Mr. Arnott, you know, it's basically, it is actually also a reflection of you as a good surgeon because you're doing this exam to demonstrate you're a safe surgeon. So actually, this is real life scenarios. You know, if I if, if I break my elbow and I come to any of the candidates' hospitals, you know, it's actually in trauma scenarios, you are the one who's going to be doing it. I mean, you're the candidate. And, you know, it, it, I, uh, why would you do uh, And that's what I'm going to do in my practice if I have a similar injury. And we have a lot of these injuries nowadays. So I would always dissect using the same appro the approach done to me by the trauma itself because it is already done to you and done for you. Absolutely, yeah, very good Thank point. You for us. Excellent point. So we have a question here from Mitwelli. He's asking if um, the fracture results in a metaphysical bone loss in, in one column. Uh, so what would you do? Would you graft that um, area or would you shorten the other column to so, achieve sort of um, equal columns? Very, very good uh, point. And uh, I think, you know, it's also based on the four factors I've mentioned, fracture geometry, fracture demographics, and patient demographics. So you have both options. Really, do I, you know, in proximal humerus, I tend to do grafting or even bone void failures, stuff like that. But in distal humerus, in my experience, we don't need we don't need to do a lot of this uh, grafting uh, if there is metaphysical loss. But what you can do is actually have a longer plate and try to reconstruct it. But if you need, you have also to have plan B in, in hand and plan C as well. So for any elbow fracture dislocation, I have I, I'm going to fix. I have an external fixator which we have on the shelf. Because I can fix everything and the elbow will be unstable, so I'll stick an external fixator in as well. And also for the, you know, Sanchez Solito in 2007 published uh, very good results for the oste shortening osteotomy. Uh, and this paper I can share with everyone if needed, but I think it's also have a good indication for when to do that. Also, it's not very common, but you can use that mainly in markedly shattered fractures and especially in open fractures where you, you are worried about the bone as well uh, quality as a fracture side. Thank you for explaining that. Thank um, you. I think that's all the questions we have. So we can move on to the next section now, which is the MCQ part. So I will be sharing the polls now. Can you or um, Imogen maybe? Um, do you mind uh, sharing the Paul for us. Good, great. Thank you. So, guys, we have three questions. Uh, all the answers are anonymized. I encourage each one of you to attempt. You're not losing anything. Um, a prof Imam will at the end go through the answers and explanation as well. So, uh, you will have one uh, minute. Uh, pay a question. That's what actually you get in the real exam. I think you get one minute, 10 seconds or so. Um, so please answer as soon as you can. And I just, while we're waiting here, just a reminder that um, if anyone is interested in taking part in the next uh, section of this um, uh, teaching session, which is the Viva, uh, please uh, send us a message, send to Hannah, 
or to myself or write on the chat box that you're interested. Um, only we have three, maximum of three available slots. Uh, they are very useful. Uh, we, highly, we highly recommend that you take part. It's worth it. You'll get feedback and um, you get into the mode of the exam. I know the next exam is not until February, but it's good to get uh, ready early. And if you talk to previous candidates who did the exams, who were regular attenders with us, uh, they found these very useful. So only one more minute to go, guys. So answer as soon as you can. So we now we have two candidates for the Viva. Uh, so only one slot left. Um, if anyone interested, please um, express their interest as soon as you can. So 72% of you guys have uh, attempted to answer. Um, and it's been now three and a half minutes. So I think, um, if anyone wants to quickly attempt, please do now, now, otherwise we will end the poll and go through the answers. Okay, we'll end the poll now. It's uh, four minutes. And uh, we'll share the results. Uh, right. Imagine. Imagine able to share the, yeah, here are the results. Yeah, can you see the results? Yes. Okay, great. So do you mind the uh, prof uh, going through the questions and the answers, please? Sure. So for the first question, the majority has got the, have got the rights so of production thermal fixation with plating and legs crew through the plate. So there was a couple of biomechanical studies, one by Corner and one by Stoffel. And they both have popularized the concept that, you know, if you use screws or wires in isolation or third tubular plates this is insufficient to allow any active range of motion and so you cannot really achieve good outcomes with these and they actually more biomechanical papers have demonstrated that if you do go for parallel plating the autoroscopic way or the mayplanic way it might be more stable although the perpendicular has been published as well to be biomechanically superior but more and more are actually in favor of the parallel plating so the best construct here would be if you go for plating and the legs screw through the plate so that you have the columnar support as well as the leg compression. For the second screw also 38% got it right. So the most common mechanism of uh, injury here is vulgar stress on an extended elbow with the forearm supinated and that's how you are going to fracture the lateral condyle in children. Uh, presenting with this and 38% uh, have got this right. For the last question, the majority also has got it right, where although there was some uh, mentioning annular ligament. So it is really important to have, uh, to have full understanding of the lateral collateral ligamentous complex because PLCL is the right answer as opposed to lateral collateral ligament is actually not part of, uh, doesn't exist. The other four structures comprise the lateral collateral ligament complex. And if you want to add in 
exam wise there are the dynamic lateral collateral support which is provided by the extensor carpi analysis and the supinator tendons which provides a secondary dynamic stability and mainly resists the posterolateral rotatory instability there so well done everyone the majority you know so the first question you had 58 percent got it right and then the second to only 35 and 38 percent got it right but well done everyone yeah, good efforts, and I think um, it's an exam as well. There are always two or three answers who very, very close, and that's in the real exam as well, and that's what we had feedback as well, so for those who done or, or going to MCQs. So it's quite tight, always tight. Uh, there are two options that are always very close. You have to decide which one is, is, is the best or the better answer or the best answer. There could be more than one correct answer, but you have to decide which one is the best. And that's why they're called single best uh, answers, isn't it? Because uh, there could yes. be more than one correct answer in there. Lovely, so um, well done everyone. Thank you to everyone who attempted to answer this question. Thank you, Prof. Iman, for going through this and uh, for um, um, writing these questions for us. Very, very useful. It's my pleasure. Um, lovely. Well, thank you very much. Now we'll move on to the next section of this uh, teaching session, which is the viva component of that. Um, so uh, we have the first candidate is Mitwali, and we have here the pleasure of having Mr. Uh, Abdul Wahid. Um, hello. hello, Mr. Abdul Wahid. Hello. How are you? Are you right? Yeah, it's good to see you. Thank you for joining thank us. You. Thank, thank uh, you very much. And it's a pleasure to have you here.